let's move on to the next session. <coughs> so I, even though um, this is a very minimal role for me, I was very pleased to be asked to be involved in today's event because I, I think this topic is uh, extremely important for central banks and uh, also for the economics profession. Of course, there's a strong overlap between central banks and economics, but let me emphasize is uh, central banks have many more uh, occupations and professions than just the world of economics. Uh, so, uh, and the particular diversity challenge actually varies quite a bit across different parts of the, of the organization, which I'm sure is true at the Bank of England as well. And uh, in this session, I, I think we're very pleased to have Andy Haldane from the Bank of England. Andy has been, uh, I think, a leader in, in this um, program of work uh, globally in terms of diversity in central banking. And uh, I'm sure we will uh, look forward to, to listening to his uh, contribution today, um, which is focused on, on the UK data. Uh, so without further delay, let me hand over to Andy. Well, thank you very much. A round of applause before I even said a word. That's, that's always nice. Um, thank you, Philip, for those, um, uh, for those kind words. Let me just start by um, congratulating the organisers um, for this uh, tripartite ECB Bank Fed uh, conference, the second of its kind. It's been absolutely spectacular. Uh, congrats, too, to all the paper presenters. Uh, I think, as Guido said at the previous session, some outstanding papers today that have really kind of built out our evidence base uh, even further to make the case even more compelling uh, than it was uh, previously. I thought what I'd do today uh, is talk about one dimension uh, of this issue. Uh, I want to try and pose and hopefully attempt to answer uh, the following question. You have uh, someone um, who is otherwise equally skilled and equally experienced doing the same thing in the same place. They differ only uh, by their gender or their ethnic background. Why should their pay differ at all? Uh, and the answer, of course, is that it shouldn't in that situation. Those pay gaps, if you like, or ought not to exist, uh, but do exist. What I thought I'd do is shed a bit of evidence on the size of those pay gaps using, as Philip mentioned, some UK evidence. Uh, how have they evolved over time? How can they be explained? And ultimately, uh, what might be done uh, to shrink those pay gaps uh, back to around zero, which is where they should be, given the way I uh, described them at the beginning. This is joint work uh, with three colleagues uh, from the Bank of England who are named here. Uh, you will see that we have a perfectly diverse set of co-authors. Uh, they did almost all of the work, so my role is very much that uh, of the token white male uh, today. Um, a question was asked at the previous session. Um, why should, uh, how could we encourage more white men to come along? and talk at events uh, uh, like this. Um, why am I here? Well, I mean, I was invited, which is very nice. Um, um, it's an issue on which I find intellectually fascinating, but more than that, about which uh, I'm very passionate, uh, indeed proud to be talking about. Truth be told, um, we are all minorities, some of the time. We've all been in situations where we felt our face hasn't quite fit. Um, diversity comes in all shapes and sizes, as Rhonda said uh, earlier on. And I think viewed in that way, um, arriving, coming and speaking at events like this should not be seen uh, as a challenging thing uh, for white men, but as a real uh, opportunity. The last three or four years, so most of my time, or a chunk of my time, uh, doing something that central bankers don't do very much of, actually, which is uh, wandering around. Um, wandering around the UK, uh, seeking out and talking to as disparate and diverse a set of communities as possible. Not the sort of people that central bankers typically talk to. 
Uh, my one learning, one learning from that three or four year experience is that the key to engagement, the key to inclusivity, is to put yourself consciously in a position of vulnerability. In other words, a situation where the agenda uh, isn't set by you, the questions uh, aren't set by you, you certainly don't have all of the answers. The issues come from the other side of the table. The language is set by the other side of the table. That you spend as much or more time, actually, listening as you do talking. You are leaning in to the uncertainty, leaning in to the vulnerability. And I think the more people, central bank or otherwise, who could act in that way, the more encouragement we could get to get them along to conferences like this, which is think, I think is absolutely uh, crucial. Let me turn then uh, to the topic, uh, and it's pay gaps. Um, in other words, does the same work uh, pay the same wage? This is an issue uh, that's of uh, some policy import and topicality, uh, including the UK. So um, Sarah mentioned the previous session that since uh, 2017, uh, companies with more than 250 employees in the UK were required by law to publish annually uh, their gender uh, pay gap. There's a consultation uh, out at the moment uh, in the UK um, asking whether something similar might also be done when it came to uh, ethnic minority uh, pay gaps across that same uh, set of uh, companies. Similar initiatives are underway uh, internationally uh, in places like uh, Iceland and Denmark and elsewhere. Uh, different detail, but the same basic principle. That is to say, should we require, or at least encourage actively, individual companies to publish any gaps that exist between how much they pay males versus females, or, or whites uh, versus non-whites uh, in uh, their workforce. At the Bank of England, uh, for our part, uh, we started publishing our gender pay gap uh, one year ahead of schedule, and have already started publishing our ethnicity uh, pay gap, even though that is not yet uh, required. I can tell you uh, that publication listed a degree of outside interest, indeed a degree of outside criticism, uh, some of which was probably uh, the unfair side of neutral, but nonetheless, I can tell you, was a very useful nudge. In fact, more than that, it was a useful dig in the ribs for us to explain why those gaps existed. Essentially, in our case, it was a question of too little senior representation by women and ethnic minorities in the organization. But as importantly, it catalyzed us to craft and indeed put renewed energy between our efforts to fill those gaps, to close that pay gap over time. In other words, disclosures, in this case of pay gaps, served as a useful disinfectant as an incentive device to individual companies and institutions to not just account for those gaps, but crucially to put in place a plan for closing them. Now, those uh, disclosures uh, are at the at present company specific and cover only a point in time. So I thought what I'd do is to take a different database and assess those pay gaps over time to see how they've evolved. And additionally, uh, at a national level. Uh, and third and finally, to try and explain uh, why they might exist. Could it be justified in terms of characteristics of the people uh, or of the job those people are uh, doing? And that's roughly uh, the plan for my presentation. Here it is set out, uh, set up with a bit just on the data. <clears throat> then talk a little bit about uh, these pay gaps, untouched, these unconditional pay gaps and how they've evolved over time. 
I'm going to cover off uh, both uh, the gender dimension, but also uh, look at the pay gaps for ethnic minorities in the UK workforce uh, as uh, well. Uh, why well, do that? Well, of course, it's of interest in its own right, but also there's a crucial interaction uh, between ethnic minority uh, and gender, a double pay problem, if you like, for ethnic minority uh, females. I want to go on and seek to do some job of explaining what lies behind these pay gaps. How can they be accounted for in terms of characteristics either of the workers or of the jobs that they are uh, undertaking. I'm going to use two approaches to do that, uh, both of which have been uh, mentioned and indeed used uh, in papers uh, earlier on today. Um, the first uh, is a decomposition. And of the various uh, many and various ways of doing that decomposition, the one I'm going to choose uh, is this uh, Oaxaca uh, blind a decomposition. And that's uh, not for reasons of statistical robustness. The real reason is because I, I really, really like saying the word Oaxaca. <laughs> really get your mouth around it. Even saying the word now, I can feel my pulse slowing, my heartbeat dropping, a certain sense of zen comes over me whenever I say the word Oaxaca, which I will now say as much as possible during the core of this. So, I mean, say to yourself under your breath now, Oaxaca. Um, it helps no end. Um, so this is the, um, this is peak zen of the presentation. It's all downhill rapidly after this, by the way, because so I'll launch into some of the data uh, and the econometrics. But um, about two thirds of the way in, um, I, will, I will come back to Oaxaca and a certain warm glow will cross uh, the audience, a little dopamine rush as you hear the word. Uh, and all the previous stuff will appear as, as just a bad dream, really. Um, Oaxaca, um, and then some golden, Claudia Golden type regressions of how we explain pay patterns uh, over time. And then finally, what might it mean for policy? Uh, given that I'm a policymaker, I want to uh, put out there, put out there a suggestion or two about not just what has happened, but what might be done uh, to close these pay gaps rather more rapidly than might otherwise uh, be the case. So uh, these are the data. They're for the UK. Um, they're over the last 25 years uh, or so uh, on individual uh, workers within the UK labor force. That gives us a slightly north uh, of half a million uh, observations uh, on individual workers at, at, in places that's nudging up to around a million uh, observations on individual workers. What this database gives us in particular, which is useful, uh, is a very rich set uh, of characteristics, both of the worker, their age, their educational background, their gender and ethnicity, but also of the job they are undertaking which sector, which occupation, part-time or full-time, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Let me uh, talk very quickly about some of the characteristics of uh, these data over time. This just looks at uh, the extent uh, of female participation in the labor force across the G7 uh, countries. The UK here is in uh, green. Broadly speaking, more or less, uh, as most of you know, all of you know, I'm sure, there's been, generally speaking, a rising tide uh, of female participation uh, in the labor force. The UK is no exception uh, to that. In fact, having recently overtaken the US, we're now uh, second only to Canada uh, in the extent of that female participation uh, in the workforce. The self-same thing is true uh, of ethnic minority participation in the UK labor force uh, as well. Other things equal. Uh, you'd expect that rising tide of representation and participation to have begun to chip away at pay gaps, whether uh, gender uh, or ethnic minority uh, based. There's also been a rising tide uh, 
uh, of educational attainment. This divvies up the sample uh, four ways, white males, white females, uh, an ethnic minority, uh, males and females. For all four cohorts, uh, educational attainment has risen very rapidly over the last 25 years or so. Let's just take the, the bottom blob, the, the dark blue uh, part of the pie chart. That measures those with a degree uh, between 94, 2019. That blue bit has increased very materially. Indeed, it's increased much more materially uh, for women and for ethnic minorities uh, than it has uh, for white males. To such an extent that as of 2019, levels of educational attainment among ethnic minorities and women are higher than those of white males in the UK. We sit at the bottom uh, of the league table when it comes to educational attainment. That is not true if you take a different cut of this cake, which is looking at uh, the skills, the professions uh, of those same four uh, cohorts. Uh, again, the dark blue uh, part uh, of this chart refers to the sort of highest paid managers, professionals, and associates component. Um, that too has grown in size over time across the four cohorts. Although, interestingly, uh, the numbers in that group are larger for white males than for either women or ethnic minorities, despite the fact that their levels of educational attainment are lower. And that at least is at least suggestive that some pay gap, gender or an ethnic minority uh, basis might exist. So let me turn now to those uh, pay uh, data. This looks at the distribution uh, of male hourly pay, this is, uh, and female hourly pay, um, left and right, on two dates, 97 uh, and 2018. Those distributions shift, as you'd expect, to the right over time as pay uh, picks up. Comparing those uh, two distributions, it's very clear this, this peak here, can you see this peak? If we can find it, this peak here, which is the peak of lower pay among women is materially higher than this peak of lower pay along men. And equivalently, uh, the upper peak of hourly pay is much fatter for men than it is uh, for women. All of which is suggestive, at least, of a gender pay gap. In fact, on this sample, uh, that gender pay gap over the last uh, 25 years or so averages just north uh, of 20 percent. This looks at that uh, gender pay gap over time, whereas we move uh, from left to right. This is the sort of time series. And I'm plotting now that the gender pay gap against uh, female participation in the workforce. The basic story is of this gender pay gap having fallen from peaks of close to 30 percent uh, in the late 1990s down to around 20 percent uh, as you enter the noughties. Strikingly, there has been precious little erosion or diminution of that gender pay gap pretty much since the dawn of the global uh, financial crisis. We can cut this gender pay gap uh, any which way. Let me cut it uh, one or two ways to illustrate. Uh, this uh, cuts it uh, by level of qualification. That's running horizontally. And also distinguishes uh, gender pay gaps uh, inside London uh, and outside of London. And the key takeaways here are those gender pay gaps tend to be larger. Uh, the lower is the level of qualification uh, of a worker. They also tend to be uh, a bit lower uh, inside London uh, rather than uh, outside uh, of uh, London. Um, turning then to uh, ethnic minority pay patterns, here again, two distributions on two dates uh, across the two groups. 
You'll see um, it's far less easy to discern much of a difference in these two distributions as between uh, uh, whites and non-whites across the workforce. And that's pretty much borne out if we look at a time series of now the ethnic minority uh, pay gap over time. Again, uh, running uh, left to right. Uh, generally speaking, uh, that pay gap has been at a lower level than the gender pay gap, average around 4% over the last uh, 24, uh, 25 years. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, the less good news is that it shows far uh, fewer signs uh, of having reduced over that self uh, same uh, period. Um, again, a few different cuts of the cake, rather different than on the gender side. Uh, if anything, uh, the ethnic minority pay gap is larger among those with higher levels of qualification. What's more, it also appears to be larger uh, in London than is the case outside of London, which is, is by itself a little strange, given that fully 40% of the ethnic minority population in the UK is resident uh, within London. In other words, some puzzles in this data as to what quite uh, is going uh, on. Um, and Rhonda just made in the previous session this very important point about disaggregation. Uh, this chart disaggregates the ethnic minority pay gap across uh, different cohorts. And you'll see from them a very mixed picture among people with different ethnic minority backgrounds. For those uh, with a Chinese or Indian or a mixed race background, their average pay is actually higher than that of the equivalent white worker, roughly around 15% higher, in a way that's not true of, for example, black and Afro-Caribbean, uh, Pakistani or Bangladeshi uh, origin uh, workers in the UK. For them, a pay gap of around 15% in the opposite direction. So those are the, the raw, the raw data, the unconditional pay gaps, the like of which are being published uh, by companies across the UK uh, as we speak. Um, but to get in, underneath the skin of what's really going on here, what I want to try and do now is to bring to the table some of the characteristics either of those workers or of the job they undertake that might account and explain for those patterns and that evolu evolution over time. In other words, to construct some conditional measure uh, of the pay gap using uh, worker-specific characteristics, for example, uh, educational background, age, tenure in work, whether they have children under the age of two, and some job-specific characteristics, uh, such as the region of the job, the occupation, the sector, whether it's full or part-time, et cetera. To be absolutely clear, even if I can explain, account for those pay gaps with these factors, I am not suggesting that makes them justifiable. You know, if the origin of them is a huge gap, a gulf in educational attainment between, say, males and females, that is not justifiable. But what this accounting decomposition and explanation can do is be suggestive of where policy action might best be directed. And as importantly, if we can't account for these gaps, even taking account of these factors, we have a very pure measure of pay bias. You might even call it uh, pay discrimination, either by gender or by ethnicity. So what do these decompositions or regressions uh, suggest? Well, Andy, what type of decomposition are you going to try? Well, I'm going to do a Oaxaca, there you see, 
I told you, a little warm glow dopamine rush. Oaxaca decomposition of, in this case, the gender uh, pay uh, gap. Uh, and on the right-hand side, um, I've broken that down into the bit that can be explained by those factors, worker or job specific, and the bit that even with those factors cannot be accounted for, you will see that it's roughly 50-50. Uh, we can explain some of that gaps in terms of looking at the left-hand side picture, in particular, the job-specific characteristics, the sector in which the job uh, is, uh, and uh, the uh, occupation uh, that uh, people are working in. Nonetheless, that still leaves a roughly double-digit pay gap that remains unexplained, a pure measure, if you like, uh, of pay bias. This tracks it over time. Uh, the grey here is the unaccounted for, unexplained uh, pay gap. The good news is that that's been falling over the last 25 years or so. The bad news is that even by the end of the sample, uh, that pay bias remains uh, in double digits. If we do the self-same, th that just plots it using, this is using regression techniques rather than Oaxaca, it tells the self-same story. Roughly speaking, a halving of the gender pay gap over time but remaining at around double-digit levels, even at the end uh, of the sample. If we do this uh, for uh, ethnic minorities, the picture is actually rather different in the following sense. Those characteristics of the worker and of the job for ethnic minorities ought to be pushing their pay above that of equivalent uh, white workers. That's what the left-hand side part of that uh, picture is showing. In other words, the raw, the unconditional pay gap data for ethnic minorities understates the extent of the pay problem in the workplace. The unaccounted for conditional pay gap for ethnic minority workers is in fact as large as it is uh, for women. I mean, the reason why on average ethnic minorities should, should other things equal be paid more than the equivalent white workers is that relatively more of them work in London. Uh, that's the orange part here. And of course, they're also on average better qualified educationally than their white equivalents. Plotted over time, the grey part here is the uh, unexplained, the conditional pay gap. It is around double digits. And what's more, and what's worrying, it shows far fewer signs of having diminished over time, despite the rising representation of ethnic minorities in the UK labour uh, force. So sort of summarising... If you like, um, these conditional pay gaps, uh, blue here is gender. That gender pay gap, conditioning other stuff, has halved over time but remains large in double digits. The ethnic minority pay gap, that too has fallen but by far less and it too remains in double digits. And for ethnic minority females, that's the yellow line here, the good news is that that gap has also halved over the last 25 years, but from a much higher level and remains materially higher even today at closer to uh, 15 uh, percentage uh, points. Uh, you'd also use a sort of analysis to explore uh, the impact of different of those factors I mentioned on different cohorts. So by running different regressions on different cohorts, white versus non-white, uh, females versus males, 
we explore the relative impact of different factors on those different cohorts. Just to run through one or two of these. Uh, educationally, we know there's a very significant uh, pay premium uh, for graduates, but it turns out that graduate pay premium is materially larger for men than it is for women. We know there's also an age-related uh, pay uh, premium. It turns out from our regressions that that pay premium is materially larger uh, for men than it is for women at age, say, 45 to 49, that's around a 10 percentage point gap more paid to otherwise identical men than to women. For part-time or non-permanent work, interestingly, uh, the pay discount or pay penalty there is in fact larger for men than it is uh, for women. I think the result discussed at the very start of the, pre of the uh, conference today, for uh, men and women with children under two, there is a pay premium uh, for men, but a material uh, pay discount for women, particularly women who are working uh, full time. And finally, uh, just the impact of the sectoral dimension, the financial sector in which many of us work, there is, you'll be unsurprised to hear, uh, a pretty fat pay premium from working in finance relative to any other sector. Uh, but if you're a man working in finance, uh, that fat pay premium comes in uh, at almost double that uh, of the otherwise identical woman working in uh, that sector. So much then uh, for the uh, diagnosis. Let me uh, skip on and maybe conclude if I can, Philip, with some reflections on what do we make of this and most importantly of all, what do we do about this? What further purposive policy action could be taken to make greater inroads into these still large and rather persistent uh, pay biases or pay gaps. Well, I've mentioned one or two things uh, here. Um, one thing would be at present, uh, I mentioned this new regime, this legal regime requiring UK companies with more than 250 employees to disclose their pay gaps. Of course, uh, many companies have far fewer than 250 employees. In fact, um, around 60% of the UK workforce work in firms with less than 250 employees. So one obvious policy extension would be to extend the reporting to include a larger number of those uh, small firms. A second would be this consultation on ethnic minority pay gap reporting. Uh, this analysis would suggest there's a strong case for making that not voluntary, uh, but mandatory and indeed to do some disaggregation of the type that Rhonda mentioned of the cohort effects within that ethnic minority uh, population. If you were being uh, more ambitious still, let's ask the question, why don't we make this a standard internationally? Why don't we harmonize how we disclose these data and seek to do so uh, across all countries? There's a quite interesting uh, analogy here in what's happened, for example, on a different area of disclosure, which is on climate change disclosure. There, we went down the route of harmonizing the nature of that disclosure. And that has really worked wonders on putting this on the radar of a great many companies right across the planet. If it's good enough for climate change, why is it not good enough for issues of diversity uh, as well? And what's more, perhaps central banks could play something of a leading role in doing just that, in catalyzing action across the piece globally. Last point. Many of you in the audience, I'm sure, will raise points about, you know, are you not overloading 
these measures of pair gaps, they are necessarily imperfect in their construction. That is all true. They are deeply uh, imperfect. But my sense is that in this area, something very, very much beats nothing. It serves as a prompt for explanation. It serves as a prompt for accountability. And it serves as a prompt for action. And in this crucially important area, we need lots more of each of those things. And disclosure, in this case of pay gaps, will be one route to achieving that. On that, Philip, I think I will stop. Thanks, everyone, for listening. So Andy got through a lot there. Um, the underlying 35-page paper is on the Bank of England website. Andy's uh, famous for uh, being one of the best writers in economics. Someone was earlier on criticizing just the economists for not being very uh, uh, clear in their language on Twitter, but in Andy's uh, papers and speeches, he's usually pretty clear. Uh, I would say, though, uh, usually Andy comes up with a pretty interesting title for his papers. Uh, not so much on this occasion. No. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, let, let's see for, for the, the next uh, version of it. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because we, we have a, um, a closing session, uh, but I do want to uh, have a minute or two if there are comments or questions from the floor. So please. Please, here in the middle. So this is a really well-researched topic in the UK. I think in the last two years that just that I can think of off the top of my head, the low pay commissioner have come out, Tim Butcher has come out with a, a study using the WERS, the workplace data set, and ASH. Wendy Olson's got one for the Government Equality Agency looking using the British Household Panel Survey because it can do a really accurate job of tracking actual work <coughs> experience. Um, Melanie Jones has got one for the um, OME, Office for Manpower Economics, using um, the Labour Force Survey and splitting the gap between men and women. Um, Edinburgh have just come out one with Ash using um, the workplace identifier. All of those are gender pay gaps studies, all of them control for ethnicity, all of them also <coughs> control for self-selection because, of course, we're not observing the wages of women who aren't actually working in the labour market. And all of them include ahaka decompositions, and all of them can include statistical significance tests for the components of the decomposition. Um, I think this is actually a really important issue when you start moving into ethnicity as well, because um, the, there's a very strong lower probability for women from Bangladesh and Pakistan backgrounds to be working in the labour market. So if you don't include gender in the ethnic pay gap analysis, then you're getting an even stronger distortion effect on the decomposition. So what I'm wondering, Andy, is why you're not talking about those results as well and why you're not placing your results in the context of these other studies that are out there and telling us about... Um, where the contributions are lying and, and what's different in the findings. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do is co collect uh, uh, se several comments and then just ask Andy to respond collectively. So please. A very quick question. I remain curious about the pay gap at the Bank of England, which you didn't show us but you have information. Okay, uh -huh. okay um, any other comments or questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask a connected question, which is clearly, given the uh, public, very important differences between public sector and private sector, uh, and in terms of policy making, uh, does this lead to particular questions for the Bank of England as part of the wider pu public sector? Uh, so I'll ask for the Bank of England uh, perspective on that. Okay, so over to you, Andy. Thank you. So on Karen's question. So. Um, I didn't go into it in detail. I hope the paper references, if not uh, all, then certainly some of the studies that you mentioned. Um, we haven't overlooked them. Um, I mean, as you say, some of those are using different sorts of surveys. We, we use the uh, Labour Force survey because it gave us a richer set of, in, in particular, individual characteristics. 
uh, over time and, and a time series in a way that's uh, less true uh, of ASH and the British Household Panel Survey. But I see those results as very much being kind of complementary uh, rather than uh, a substitute for the other stuff that you mentioned, uh, Karen. If, if I had more time, I'd have gone into what others have said about this, um, but hopefully it's there in the in the, back, in the in the forty page paper that you've all had about half an hour to read while sitting listening to me over the last uh, few minutes. Um, on the um, the question about our gaps, which I conspicuously skipped over that slide a bit too quickly. Um, so um, the latest numbers were on the gender side, uh, 23%, uh, and on the ethnic minority, minority side, just, just shy of 7%. Um, so those, those are the raw numbers. They can be fully accounted for, as I mentioned, by compositional effects in our what you, too few, uh, too little senior representation of, of women and ethnic minorities uh, in our workplace. Uh, we have made, we have targets for senior representation among uh, both women and ethnic minorities at the bank, uh, and a timeline for getting from here to there. Uh, and that's our plan for closing the gap from the current uh, levels that it is, uh, it is at. Um, to Philip's point, I mean, um, across most parts of the UK civil service, they're doing something similar already. Uh, I'm absolutely of the view, and I know others from the bank, many from the bank here, including Joe, who leads for the bank on this stuff, uh, would say that, that the reason we went out early, a year earlier than, than any other company, was precisely because we see ourselves as having a key signaling and catalytic role to play. You know, that we can serve as an exemplar for others, not just within the public sector, but within the private sector uh, as well. I mean, putting yourself first also meant we were the kind of lightning rod for quite a lot of criticism early on. But I think that is a price well worth paying for putting your best uh, foot forward on this issue, for disclosing and explaining and having a plan to back up how you'll rid yourself of this over time. And that's the, that's the track we've taken. So, just before I f finish this session, let me advertise uh, some other work which is kind of connected. So when I was at the Central Bank of Ireland, uh, Central Bank of Ireland as a supervisor uh, had a lot of uh, interesting access to fitness and probity applications. So fitness and probity is a gateway to senior roles in, in the uh, <coughs> fin financial sector. And uh, the differences between uh, uh, male and female applicants or nominees uh, for senior positions was extremely stark. So if you haven't seen that work, I would recommend uh, uh, that's another angle, because again, you, you point out this big difference in management. So going to senior management, what, what explains why uh, when, when it comes to C-suite and related roles, uh, th these gender differences are, are so stark, uh, very stark, it, it's quite interesting. So with that, let me thank Andy and uh, we can move on to the final session, so th thank you. <laughs>